Hamas fires more rockets, Israel warns of grave consequences, and Catholic relief is on the way to Gaza. There's countries in this world where you'll never see anything like this, no churches. Today, the State Department's calling them out. I'll have that story next. 16 million lives were lost in World War I, which started 100 years ago today. And Pope Francis gives another interview, including his 10 tips on how to be happy. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 28, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. As we look at your news now, the U.S. government took steps today challenging worldwide threats to religious freedom. Our Jason Calvey reports. As you walk the streets here in the United States, it's likely that you'll come across churches and sometimes several churches. But in other places in the world, that's not going to happen. And today, Secretary Kerry and the State Department are calling out countries they say are particular concerns. 75% of the world's population still lives in countries that don't respect religious freedoms. Secretary Kerry releases today the State Department's 2013 International Religious Freedom Report. It lists countries of particular concern, including China, Iran, Sudan, Saudi Arabia. Turkmenistan is added to this list this year, and the secretary says North Korea stands out. Members of religious minorities are ripped from their families and isolated in political prison camps. They're arrested and beaten, tortured and killed. This American pastor knows the pains of being jailed for his faith. He's serving eight years in Iran. On numerous occasions in the context of the talks, around the talks, urged the government of Iran to, to release him. Does the secretary intervened in himself? Um, I believe the secretary has raised his case, yes. The report says a major problem is people forced out of their homes because of their faith. And it says the Christian presence in the Middle East is a shadow of its former self. But the International Religious Freedom Report is not all bad news. They also lift up instances where religious freedom has been protected. One example, in Egypt, where Muslim men surrounded a Catholic church to protect it from attacks. Reporting in Washington, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. Finally moving to fill a position that's been vacant since last October. President Obama today nominated Rabbi David Saperstein as ambassador at large for international religious freedom. He is an adjunct professor at Washington's Georgetown University and director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Though he helped pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, Saperstein decried the Supreme Court's recent Hobby Lobby decision. During an interview after the ruling, he said the court's conclusion was misreading of RIFRA. Dr. Robert George joining us by satellite from Princeton University, the vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. It's good to have you with us. I wonder what your take is on the appointment of Rabbi Saperstein today by President Obama. I'm pleased. Rabbi David Saperstein is a man with a long and strong record in the international uh, human rights field. We've been waiting for a long time for President Obama uh, to fill this uh, position, and I think it's fair to say that I and others have been complaining that it's been unfilled for so long. But I'm pleased that the president has filled the position and has filled it with a person with experience and dedication uh, in the area of international human rights. He was part of the group that kind of put together uh, RIFRA, but he criticized the Supreme Court's ruling that was based on that, the Hobby Lobby ruling. What do you think of that? Well, of course, I'm speaking to you as the vice chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, and our commission does not uh, comment on domestic religious freedom issues. We have no statutory authority. So I'll tell you what, I'll take off that hat and just speak as an individual and a, a religious freedom activist and as a professor. Uh, and uh, I'll say that I've been disappointed uh, with Rabbi Saperstein on that score. When it comes to domestic religious freedom uh, issues, uh, he and I have sometimes agreed and sometimes disagreed. On Hobby Lobby, we, uh, we disagreed. I think he should have taken a strong stand in favor of religious freedom in the Hobby Lobby uh, case. But in previous uh, uh, cases on the domestic front, uh, he took a strong stand on what I think the right side is. For example, in the Hosanna Tabor case, which vindicated the ministerial exception, which protects uh, the religious 
religious freedom of religious groups, churches, uh, religiously based schools and hospitals and so forth. So his record from my point of view as an individual is uh, mixed on the domestic side, but uh, I certainly like what I see uh, from Rabbi Saperstein when it comes to international religious freedom. We're on the same page there. Well, let's go back to that international scene. Secretary of State John Kerry says 75% of the world's population lives in countries where their religious beliefs are not protected. Uh, first of all, that seems to be a very high number. What areas of the world are of most concern to you? Well, I'm... Uh unhappy to say that John Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry, is right on this. Uh, the Pew Foundation has done a very thorough study, uh, and the truth is that about three-quarters of the population of the world live in regimes or under regimes that either are themselves regular routine violators of religious freedom of their citizens or who stand by and permit thugs and mobs and terrorists to act with impunity, uh, violating the rights of people and persecuting religious minorities. And we find this, alas, across the globe, from North Korea to China to Iran to Iraq, to Syria, to Saudi Arabia, to uh, Egypt, to Nigeria, and over across the ocean to uh, Cuba. We even find religious uh, freedom violations in developed Western liberal democracies. Increasingly, we're worried about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, the, the, you know, an ancient horrible thing that has uh, uh, seemed to increase in velocity. Uh, in Europe, uh, even uh, laws we find in Europe now prohibiting kosher slaughter or prohibiting male infant uh, circumcision in some jurisdictions. So uh, the world is not a great place just at the moment for religious freedom, and we need to be doing something about that. And our country really needs to be in the forefront of protecting religious freedom. First of all, by setting a very good example at home, and secondly, by using the influence we have in the world, which is tremendous, uh, to come to the assistance of persecuted minorities, to stand up for religious freedom for all people of all faiths. Dr. Robert George, thanks for joining us tonight from Princeton University. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A federal appeals court has struck down Virginia's ban on so-called same-sex marriage. A three-judge appeals court panel in Richmond ruling today that provisions barring gay marriage and denying recognition of same-sex unions performed in other states violate the U.S. Constitution. This Virginia case is just one of several that could go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, nine kids are among ten dead after a strike on a Gaza park. Israel says they were hit by a Hamas rocket that fell short. Gaza officials blame Israeli airstrikes. And today, Israel's prime minister warns of a prolonged campaign against Hamas. Catherine Elliott has more on the abrupt ending to a short weekend Middle East ceasefire. Even as Hamas said it agreed to a UN-mediated ceasefire over the weekend, Israel cited incessant rocket fire as a reason to restart its military ground operation. Hamas refused to stop the attacks. Israel agreed to five ceasefire proposals. Hamas rejected or broke all of them, even the ones that they requested by themselves. The United Nations Security Council held another emergency meeting overnight issuing a presidential statement. The Security Council expresses strong support for an immediate and unconditional humanitarian ceasefire. Hamas had asked for a more strongly worded resolution. The status quo is not sustainable, and to return to the situation before this aggression is not sustainable. We need to see fundamental changes of the life of our people in the Gaza Strip. For its part, Israel suggested sustainable peace could only come through demilitarizing Gaza. I said it and I'll repeat it again. If it's going to be quiet in Israel, it's going to be quiet in Gaza. It's as simple as it gets. But as it has so often been shown, achieving a lasting peace in the Middle East is anything but simple. Catherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Catherine. The Church of Jesus Christ cannot remain silent in the face of the increasing needs of the Gazans. That statement issued today by Caritas, the Catholic Church's international aid organization. Caritas is launching an emergency appeal saying most of the victims in Gaza are children, women, and the elderly. Initially, Caritas will provide medical supplies and medicines to four hospitals and fuel for their generators. Also, 2,000 families will receive emergency food aid. Pope Francis made an urgent appeal for peace this weekend. He spoke about the victims of war, especially children. Bambini morti, bambini feriti, 
bambini mutilati. Pope Francis passionately asked the world with all his heart to stop the violence. He also urged those listening to join him in prayer for peace in the Middle East, in Iraq, and in Ukraine. Well, Pope Francis becomes the first pope to ever visit a Pentecostal church. He visited a church that's being built in the southern Italian city of Caserta. He also met privately with a Pentecostal preacher who's an old friend. The Holy Father apologized for Catholic persecution of Pentecostals during Italy's fascist regime. He stressed that there is unity in diversity within Christianity. The Pope said some may be surprised he visited an evangelical church, but he said he went to see his brothers. Francis has met unofficially with several Pentecostal and evangelical preachers recently. Well, earlier this weekend, the Pope celebrated Mass in the square in front of the Royal Palace of Caserta. It's, it used to be the residence of the King of Naples. He urged the crowds to say no to corruption, to live the gospel, and to care for the poor and those who are on the margins of society. An international team tried again today but failed to reach the crash site of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 in Ukraine. They left without the press contingent. They were stopped by the pro-Russian Ukrainian separatists. Witnesses tell CNN the team of expert observers and investigators turned back toward Donetsk without reaching the crash site. Reporters on the ground say they are hearing regular shelling in that area. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has hoped for safe access to the site after negotiations with both sides in that conflict. President Obama and European leaders have been conferring about next steps for dealing with the crisis in Ukraine. The White House says Obama held a joint call today with the leaders of Germany, France, Britain and Italy. The call comes as the U.S. and European Union weigh tougher sanctions against Russia. The West accuses separatists in eastern Ukraine of shooting down the Malaysian passenger jet. Russians are being blamed for supplying the rebels with sophisticated military equipment, including those ground-to-air missiles. Well, both black boxes from the Algerian passenger jet that went down in Mali last week have now arrived in France for analysis. The MD-83 crashed early Thursday, shortly after takeoff, from the capital of Burkina Faso en route to Algiers. French flags are lowered to half-staff for three days in memory of the dead. Nearly half of the 118 who died in that crash were French. France has taken a leading role in the investigation. Bad weather is thought to be the the reason for that plane being brought down, but investigators have not ruled anything out at this point. The latest outbreak of Ebola has now killed more than 670 people in West Africa. Those figures coming today from the World Health Organization. Ebola is one of the most contagious and deadly diseases in the world. There is no known cure. The symptoms begin with fever and sore throat and escalate to vomiting, diarrhea and bleeding. Health leaders of the region say many people are still in denial about this deadly virus. Some communities are trying to stop its spread by washing their hands with water and disinfectant and increasing overall levels of hygiene. Millions of Muslims around the world are celebrating the first day of Eid al-Fitr. That's a holiday today. It marks the end of the month-long fast of Ramadan. Many went to mosques early Monday to observe traditional Eid prayers. Eid celebrations were subdued this year in areas including Malaysia and Gaza, where people are mourning the loss of life. Coming up, lightning strikes a Southern California beach. One man is dead and a dozen swimmers injured. And what's the secret to a happy life? Pope Francis gives 10 tips in his latest media interview. Thanks for joining us on this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick, and a rare electrical storm hits the California coast. Lightning kills one man and injures at least a dozen people at the beach. Catherine Zeltner has the story. It sounded like a sonic boom. It literally shook the building, shook us on the courts. A sunny day at California's Venice Beach turned deadly Sunday. I happened to see this crazy bolt of lightning that I had never seen ever in my entire life. A rare lightning storm took beachgoers by surprise, leaving one man dead and a dozen others injured. We heard the biggest boom we've ever heard right? in our entire lives. We hit, lives. hit the ground and felt it like come over us. The sound of thunder captured on tape. <laughs> Emergency crews treated at least 13 patients at the scene, all of whom, according to the officials, were either in or near the water. Of those, a scuba diver seen here after being resuscitated. 
seven adults and one teenager were transported to local hospitals. One man in his 20s lost his life. All of a sudden there was a big flash of light and a boom and I felt like someone punched me in the back of my head like right here and it went down my whole side of my right body and my calf sort of locked up and I fell over and I looked up and everybody else was you know falling over. Helicopter footage captured by KCBS shows lifeguards rushing to help an injured swimmer and administering CPR before loading the man into a truck and bringing him to an ambulance. A terrifying scene leaving beachgoers in shock. I haven't ever seen in LA something like that and heard thunder that close. It, it literally knocked me off my chair. Katherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. And investigators had now charged two men with murder in a carjacking and crash that killed three children and critically injured their mother. Police say the suspects, Jonathan Rosa and Cornelius Crawford, ran from the scene in northern Philadelphia after Friday's crash. The three children were selling fruit for a church fundraiser at the intersection in North Philly. Three women remain hospitalized today, including the mother of the children who died. The arrest came today following a three-day manhunt. And a family beach outing turns tragic in Florida. A man is killed. His daughter left fighting for her life. Susie Pinto reports they were hit by a small plane that was making an emergency landing. She had um, what seemed to be friends, even if they didn't know her, they were there comforting her. A mother distraught after her husband and nine-year-old daughter are hit by a small plane while walking along a beach in Venice, Florida. The dad looked very bad condition. They were performing CPR on him. He had blood on his face. The pilot of the plane forced to make an emergency landing after sending a distress signal to authorities. Definitely not something you expect, just going on the beach, having some fun with your family, and it's just terrible to have something happen like that. The man struck on the beach, identified by authorities as 36-year-old Omi Irizari, was killed at the scene. His nine-year-old daughter, Oceana, airlifted to a local children's hospital and said to be in critical condition. Both the pilot and a passenger in the plane uninjured in the crash. It's got to be devastating, and I, my prayers are definitely with them in this time. Video from the scene shows the 1972 Piper Cherokee on the sand just feet away from the ocean, its nose pointed down. Its front landing gear destroyed. According to local reports, preliminary evidence suggests that the plane may have lost power but authorities are still looking into what caused the fatal crash. We don't know exactly what, what caused the crash, but the NTSB is en route to Venice and will investigate fully. Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Susie. Pope Francis marks the first 500 days of his pontificate, granting an interview to a newspaper in his native Argentina. Francis reflected on many things during the interview with Viva, some topics he touched on, memories of his youth, social issues such as immigration, even the secret to happiness. Some of the tips that he gave include giving yourself to others, playing with children, and spending Sundays with your family. Up next, remembering the millions who died, we mark the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. And Connecting Continents, a White House summit for young leaders from Africa. grateful you're joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick and a bipartisan deal to improve veterans health care would direct at least 17 billion dollars to try to fix the VA health system. Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Jeff Miller reached the agreement over the weekend to improve the health program recently scandalized by long wait times and falsified records. The Senate is also expected this week to confirm former Procter & Gamble CEO Robert McDonald as the new VA secretary. Tonight, we remember the millions who died in one of the deadliest conflicts in human history. Today marks 100 years since the beginning of the First World War. Wyatt Goolsby reports from the World War I Memorial here in Washington. Yeah, Brian, the World War I Memorial may not be as big as or get as much attention as other landmarks here in Washington, D.C., but for many, this is still a very important memorial, not only to remember the war effort itself, but for all of those soldiers who fought and gave their lives. It was on July 28, 1914, that the Great War started. On that day, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The war would soon spread across Europe and across the globe. Franz Ferdinand, who was against the military involvement of Austria-Hungary and the Balkan Wars, tipped the scales. He provoked the war that he always tried to prevent through his own death. That is certainly a very big tragedy of history. On Sunday, Pope Francis marked the anniversary with a plea for dialogue. As we remember this tragic event, 
I hope the mistakes of the past won't be repeated, but rather the lessons of history be taken into account. Francis cited Pope Benedict XV, who lived during World War I. He said the war was a useless massacre. 16 million combatants were killed. Back here in the U.S., the memorials are still here, but the public memory is starting to fade. Last American World War I veteran died in 2011. The U.S. would declare war on Germany late in the conflict in 1917. One year later, 1918, the war ended. For Pope Francis, the lesson from history is clear. Everything is lost with war. Nothing is lost with peace. Let us never resort to war. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Wyatt. And the White House is honoring singer Linda Ronstadt, DreamWorks Animation Chief Jeffrey Katzenberg, and public radio host Diane Rehm, among others, for their contributions to the arts and humanities. The president presented the national award to 22 people in the East Room of the White House today. The National Medal of Arts is the highest award given to artists and arts patrons by the federal government. It's awarded to people for their outstanding contributions to excellence and growth of the arts in the United States. 500 young adults from the continent of Africa are at a summit in Washington this week. It's part of the president's Young African Leaders Initiative to support leadership and enterprise in places like Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. It also connects African leaders with Americans. Today, the president announced the program will double to 1,000 fellows and be renamed for Nelson Mandela. One participant encouraged her fellow Africans to be the architects of their own future. Africa, you are the ones that will testify of the greatness and the light of our African continent. By your works, all the world will know that Africa is no longer a sleeping giant, but that indeed it is awake and it is open for business. Today's event comes a week before the White House hosts the largest summit in presidential history with African heads of state. And now the Republican response. <laughs> no, seriously, Chad Connolly is director of the Faith Engagement for the Republican National Committee. Chad, it's good to have you with us. Why is the GOP so interested in people of faith? Thanks for having me, Brian. I appreciate you having me tonight. Um, I was chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party, and as, after losing, I had sent 1,400 South Carolina Republicans that volunteered to eight battleground states. I was intimately involved in the 2012 election, and the thing I noticed was the faith segment, as a person that's serious about my faith, was largely ignored, kind of taken for granted. And so when I came to see Chairman Priebus after the election and went, how did we lose? And I started looking at the numbers, I realized we had really neglected this segment that's our most reliable voting block. It is a very powerful voting block. I know many of you, our viewers, are people of faith, but some might look at this and say, well, you're just using religion and faith as, as a political ploy here. Well, it's funny, you know, you get the same room and you'll have a, a faith leader, a pastor, a priest who'll say, well, the party can't do this. And the same room across the room, somebody says, why hasn't the party ever done this? Look, the Republican Party is a natural home for people of faith. And we're serious about those issues and we're serious about outreach. When you lose, you get a chance to say, eh, what have we done wrong? We ought to be doing better in areas that we've not messaged properly in. But in the areas where we win a big segment, we ought to run up the score. That's what this is all about. So are people of faith typically very active in the political arena? What kind of a difference can they make at the polls? Uh, you know, look, I think it's an obligation. I think it's our responsibility. I think our vote's not political at all. I think it's spiritual. I think it's a witness and a testimony to the people that we need leaders who reflect what we believe in, our core values. So they can be a very important block. It is the most reliable voting block in the party. Our party is a natural home for people of faith. They can make a huge difference if they get out and vote their values. You're a popular speaker with Tea Party events. Is the Tea Party big in this area? Uh, I think it's huge in this area. You know, I, look, I came up, uh, I'm a speaker for a living before I did this and before I was chairman in South Carolina, and I spoke at a lot of Tea Party events, and I found that a lot of folks that were serious by their faith were in those meetings. They're not just concerned about just the social issues. They're concerned about the spending and the debt and those kind of things, too. So it's no question there are a lot of folks that are serious by their faith who are in that segment. All right, from the RNC, Chad Connolly, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for watching. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch anytime again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and may God bless you.